expression. Stanley, thank you so much and take it away. Well, okay, so I'm hoping not to be too long and dry. And if I get out in a rabbit hole, I want everybody to call rabbit hole on me. And, you know. Wanna show the picture first of the pub? Uh, the sign? Yeah, so there's the pub sign. The real thing. <laughs> All right, so, so this is uh, a little bit about the history of the pub. I only really know the first, like its inception in the first couple of years. And then I, we sold to Frank and I became a customer, another belly at the bar. So anyway, let me read a, a couple of little things about how the pub got going and some stuff. And then we'll all tell our stories because we all have a whole lot of them, I'm sure, I hope. So anyway, welcome to this Zoom meeting on the pub. And this is the 50th anniversary of the pub. It started in the spring of 71, and I believe it ended in the fall of 83, 12 years of running, and it has been out of business three times longer than it ever ran. And we still remember it, and it's still something. It was the right place at the right time. And I, what I really want to first say is, I want to talk a little bit about the time, what was going on in the country when the pub started. And so for me personally, I made my way to the University of Georgia in the late spring of 68 and went to college there. And in those years from 68 to 70, 67 to 70 or more was a real time of social and political upheaval. There was a lot going on. Martin Luther King had been assassinated, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. Um, there were anti-war protests. The draft had just been reinstated. There were um, segregation protests. Kent State had happened. Um, Pod and LSD with the with the things that everybody did. Um, women were fighting for control of their lives, burning their bras. You know who they are, who they were. <laughs> Uh, Richard Nixon's impeachment thing and Patty Hearst, Tanya thing happened in a couple of years future. It was just a lot of people on the move, a lot of hippies. It, it was a wonderful time. Um, and so against that backdrop, I personally graduated from college, made my, I was able to graduate with a respectable graduation and came home and on the night I came home, it was I drove straight through and it was a terrible night and I went to the Islesboro Inn, which I think might've been the Colonial Inn, to have a happy hour drink and, and kind of get my life together because I didn't have a clue about what was gonna happen in September. All I knew was I was gonna work for Donnie Pendleton at the village market. And I mean, this seems like such a small thing, but the bartender accused me of stealing his raincoat and it didn't seem like that was the right place for the right time and it was really unfriendly and I had just, uh, a seminal moment saying something's got to change and Osborough needs something. And that was like a kernel or something. So I went to work for Donnie and DP, my cousin David was there working and we dreamed and dreamed and dreamed. And, and one day Donnie says, hey, you should buy the old post office building over there because Charlie Donald owns it. And I don't think he wants to. So anyway, we bought it from Charlie Donald and still didn't have the ability to do much with it. So Donnie, pulls out his wallet one day and gives us a thousand dollars cash and said, here's the down payment, go get a loan at Camden National Bank. So we did and we talked to Mr. Wadsworth there at the bank who was like, you know, Mr. Quintessential banker guy. And, and we thought, well, we look like hippies and whatnot and we're not gonna have any luck here. And when the meeting was over, he says, you know, there's nothing I like better than helping young people with their dreams and starting something. And I'm going to lend you ten thousand dollars, five thousand to buy it, and five thousand to turn the bottom into a restaurant and turn the upstairs into a living space. Five thousand dollars to do that. Can you imagine? These days, I don't know what you can't buy a refrigerator for five thousand. So anyway, um, where were we? So okay. So we got the money and it took a while for it to happen. Wait, it didn't, it's like the money didn't change hands and the deal happened till the end of October. But DP and I had moved in and I think to the second floor front left 
bedroom because there was a place for a wood stove. There was a thimble there, and we started taking the ripping the inside of the building apart and burning the logs in the wood stove. And then when the money when the money changed hands, we had to make a in earnest a plan. And the and the obvious thing to do was that the pub had to move, and that was maybe beyond us. So we bought some timbers from Lima Carson who'd salvaged them out of the ocean. And we brought them down and they looked so small and the pub looked so big, we realized we just couldn't do it. It was beyond us. And so we went to Nobleboro Building Movers and they said, Roland Bragg said, for $1,200, I'd move, well, they'd move the pub back to a, a spot, but we didn't have $1,200 in the budget. But anyway, so we sold a piece of land to Lamont who put Ace and Diane's house in that spot and we got that money. So we cut the trees back there and you know, we measured things up and squared it up and took a siding off tumble down dick. And we went to South Portland and rented a two man gas powered post hole digger, you know, and we dug like 35 post holes and stuck the butt butts of those cedar trees in them. The, bull, the building movers came on Friday afternoon and left on Sunday and the pub was sitting back there on those posts. It was quite amazing. And then we, shovel and pickaxe dug a trench from the back of the pub to the road and hooked in the sewer line that was something and then we filled it back in and we dug another trench to the well and then we were ready to go and so then uh, all of that happened i'm going to say in the end of march and so at that point we moved inside to so the first of april and we Took the stairs out, put stairs in the back. We ripped out the wall. We built a bar. We Hoyt came in and sprayed the whole ceiling inside. We removed the ceiling with a dark brown stain so you couldn't see anything. Boy, that was the messiest job ever. It blew a hundred years of dust out. <sighs> Hoyt was brown when he left, and we went to Austin to get a bar. Yeah, and then so yeah, so we went to uh, the Bowery and we bought used restaurant equipment. Uh, the pizza oven, glasses, and the the wood for the bar top, and I don't know, all lots of stuff. We bought the we bought the booths out of the drift in that had closed, and then we bought a lot of stuff out of a Dairy Queen that closed in Booth Bay, and brought all of that stuff up there. And God, I don't know what else. When did you open? And so. The first day of July, this is like two months later, we opened up and I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here real quick. Let me see, share the screen before I move on. Uh, host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Can I, can I share my screen? And well, anyway, so we opened up on the 1st of July and the opening- uh, Make him a host or a co-host and he can do it. Okay, and so- Okay. Now, can I do it, you think? There we go. So, can anybody see this? No. I'm afraid- I would just read on. Anyway, I guess I don't know. Share. I don't know. Can anybody hear me? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, can you see this? Yes. So this is me. This is me when it when it opened. Swamp thing. That's what I looked like. That's DP. We, so he and I were opening crew. His Kim Christiana, she was opening crew. She was our I'm gonna say she was our our art consultant, our start, she was our stylist. Like, you know, she knew, Interior she knew, yeah, you know, I don't know about that, but she knew about like a little bit about everything that we didn't know anything about. And there's, here's another one of her. Kim and Dave. Kim and Dave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and one more, how do I, here we go. A couple of more right here. So here is the pub moved back away from the road. And you can see, yeah, and here it is from the back. You can see we stuck all of those 
butts of cedar trees in there and they just pulled it right back there on I-beams. <laughs> and, Do you have a picture of Tom? Uh, no, okay. So anyway, so that was the opening, opening night and right there in the beginning, everybody in town was just so happy that there was something going on and there was something for everybody. Um, Let me get back to your regular screen. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get back to my regular screen. Stop share. Oh, stop share. Okay. So anyway, um, let's see. And so anyway, it turned into a quite a nice spot. It was, it was, it was a common area for a lot of people of all walks of life, all social and economic and everything else status. And I just want to read one little thing that Kim sent me uh, about those times. And she said, and I quote, I remember there was a big guy, self-style artist who painted the sign for the pub for free beer. And I remember he was painting and working on that for three weeks worth of free beer when I had to cut him off. <laughs> And he uh, left his job as Yogi Bear at Disneyland. And he was one of the many hippie <laughs> pilgrims. I love that. Hippie pilgrims at that time. So many of you, so many of whom made their way to Islesboro, making us feel correctly or not as if we were at the hub of a real 60s scene. We shared certain attitudes about peace and justice, loved our music as well as our beer. And for many of us, other substances that weren't strictly legal. I remember sharing the derision at the sign of the American chicken, peace sign, that I for one, which was ubiquitous in those days and hooting at Merle Haggard's Oki from Muskogee. I for one didn't recognize what a great song it was, kind of an early cancel culture impulse. So there were just people around and I don't remember everybody who worked there when we DP and I did it for the first two years and I couldn't even remember who lived there. I can't even remember the out the, the layout of the pub upstairs anymore. You know, I, I, I think all the time, but anyway, so that went on for a couple of years with us. And in the winter of 1972, Frank Mazur came up here because he had seen that a house was for sale in the Boston Globe and it was that house across from the library. Um, and he bought that house and he frequented the pub that summer. And Frank saw the pub for the great community gathering spot that it had become and he wanted to support its continuance. And he bought it from DP and myself. He never ran, and he owned it the whole rest of the time that it was open. And he never ran it himself, but he made it possible for all of the others to do it. He maintained the building, he maintained the insurance. Um, he loved the pub and he appreciated the spirit of the pub. And it was fun and it stayed fun. You know, musicians came out of the woodwork, the dance floor bounced, and I like to say the third floor swayed. It was a moving place. All in all, I'm, I'm about done here. Uh, I think DP ran the pub more than anybody. He ran it with me for the first two years. I think he might have run it alone the third year. I think and he might have finished for somebody else. And he also ran it with Al Ginsberg and, and Janet and Judy Ottman the last two years, which I think were 82 and 83. Uh, as far as music went, Rocky Cox was the guy the first year, I think. There might have been others who appeared, but he was our guy and he was high on rock and roll and low on the words. He didn't know the words to anything, but boy, he was a showman. And as I understand it from Dave Lewis, he showed up the last week of the first year and he, he really brought some more music and he formed a duo with Dave, I mean, with Rocky. And I think Dave Lewis played in various bands every year of the pub's existence following that. And I think it was Diesel Brothers, Blue Northern, Searsmont Street Band, there might have been others. And then I see Thorne here and he played in a band, Tulsa, that showed up there. And I think maybe that's how Willie and Joe got here and they're still here. And so anyway, that's all I've got to say. That's all I remember. And year three, I have no idea who ran it. So I think DP did. And so anybody else has got these stories, I mean, Spiesko was just telling me one today about, he camped out that first year up by the Narrows and he's the reason the town has a, ordinance about you got to have the owner of the land's permission to camp like <laughs> what's that all about <laughs> hey dave lewis are you there 
Where's Dave Lewis? I'm right here, Stan. Oh man, talk about some music. <clears throat> well, uh, I don't want to go on too long because there's so many people here that I'm yeah. really pleased to see. Um, but I made a couple of notes. So um, I showed up on the island to visit Danny Patton and Maddie Coombs up by the Meadow Pond uh, at the end of the first year. And I hung out there for maybe two and a half weeks. And um, we were just living the life up there by the Meadow Pond, you know, and there was a bunch of nice green stuff growing in the woods. And, um, and then one day Danny says in the afternoon, hey, let's take a ride down to the pub. And I said, there's a pub on this island? He said, yeah. So we borrowed Henry Coombs's little tan Volkswagen bug, drove down to the pub. It was the middle of the afternoon, walked in. There's DP behind the bar. I'd never met him. Um, he just smiles at us and waves and reaches in his uh, chest freezer, pulls out a couple of frozen mugs, well, three of them, pours three beers, sets them down on the bar. Then he reached in his pocket, pulled out a little bag of something and rolled up a little smoke of some kind. <laughs> and then that started going around. And then he spoke and said, how are you guys doing? You know, we got introduced. And uh, that was in the fall. And I think the pub closed a week or two after that for the season. You um, played a lot of music in that amount of time. Well, I never played then. I oh, don't even did. know if I had a guitar with me on that trip. Oh. I think I hitchhiked up. And, and, you never uh, played the first year at all? No, no, not huh. once. Oh. But then um, somehow I communicated, and I'm not sure I even met Rocky then, but somehow it was communicated over the winter and established that he and I would both play there the next year. Oh. And I showed up with a couple of guitars, and there was a nice electric guitar a friend of mine owned that he played all summer. It was an old... Gibson Les Paul Jr., which was really a nice guitar. A friend of mine had loaned it to me for the summer, so I loaned it to Rocky. <laughs> anyway, so the second summer, I got a job working at the Islesboro Inn for Bob Chase, and it was half days. I was mowing the lawns and pulling some weeds and stuff, and it was very easy going. He was an easy guy to work for. I didn't work that hard. So I show up at the pub about noon one day, and Rocky's right in there at the bar, and I think DP was behind the bar. Rocky goes, get a beer and come over here. So we go over the corner in the far corner. And he leans over and says to me real seriously, these guys want to pay us to play here. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, you know. Um, and so that's the first place I ever got paid to play my guitar. I'd been in the Navy playing the French horn and I played a few French horn gigs around, you know. But, so, um, and we were Lewis and Cox and um, we would, Somebody had taken a couple of straight chairs and sawed the backs off them. So they're just like these little stools. And we would drag two of them up to a booth, play a couple of songs, and those people would pour us a beer out of their pitcher and give us a slice of pizza. And we would move over to the next booth and do it all again, you know, only with different songs. And uh, so that was like the, the summer, you know, we just did that all summer. And then a few other people drifted in and out. I think Thon and Joe were there before I was ever there. I think. Thon's father would come to the island in the summer and paint. Yeah. And uh, he was a great artist. And um, so they had, what was it? The Sergeant House over on the west side, right? Yeah. And, um, and then Joe would come up. And I think those guys were playing as a duo before I was ever even there. I remember, go, I remember going in there one time and they were playing and everybody seemed to know who they were except for me, somehow. How so old they, were you, Dave? Um, probably 22 or three. I was just out of the Navy. I've been out of the Navy for about a year. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, let me just look at my notes real quick. So people I remember that played there, I talked to Ando recently. And hi, Ando. Um, you said that you used to play some duo gigs in there with Willie. And I wondered, did you ever play there with Rico Eastman? He was, uh, you guys were playing together that in those days some and, and Rico was going out with a young woman named Jenny Mena and I wonder if she ever went over there and played. Ando, do you remember those? I'm not hearing him, but I saw him before. He's right there. No, hey, Ando. That's really I mean, right. Willie, I mean. He's still, oh, he's still on mute probably. Oh. Jenny Mena did play there. Okay, great. And then I remember Bob Reedy and Glenn would play in there sometimes. And Bob played the band show and Glenn played bass. And then there was a, a, then Glenn had a band that played there called Naughty, G-N-A-W-D-Y. <laughs> and that band had the drummer, Bob Evans, that went on to become the next drummer for the Sears Lone Street Band, the second, you know, the second round of personnel. Um, a band with Phil Davinsky, I'm pretty sure, 
called Brassworks played there. And they did yeah. Blood, Sweat, and Tears material. And Jeff Densmore was the drummer in that band, too. And then um, what else have I got here? Kathy Blunt. Oh, yeah. Played, yeah. played in there a few right. times. And, uh, and then another memory. Well, someone mentioned in the email that remember Henry Coombs and, and um, uh, Wilson Porters. Yeah. Well, what's his, Freddie Pendleton, was it? Yeah. yeah. And I remember another time at about midnight, Freddie Pendleton was out there mowing his lawn on a Saturday night at midnight because he was awake and he said, Well, I can't go back to sleep, so I'm going to mow my lawn. So, yeah. And, um, I have a lot more memories, but somebody else should take a turn. Yeah, the pub wasn't kind to Freddie. So no. What we exposed his house, and then his house was right on the parking lot, and yeah. and then he would he. Which is Melissa's house yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and then he wasn't supposed to be drinking or smoking, and then Shirley died, and he came right over to the pub, <laughs> and he's you know, and he started you know drinking and smoking and playing poker. That's all he wanted to do. And Wally Gilbert took care of him. They, they caretake, would caretake him. He, he, he always wanted to stare at the girls with his pretty blue eyes. He said, he said I can knock them all dead. <laughs> <laughs> and he was about 85. Yeah, right. So we have, um, I just wanted to uh, point out, um, I don't know if people know about the chat um, option. If you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a little, um, it says chat and you can type in questions and um, and then you can respond and you can talk to each other um, this way. But one of the um, questions was, uh, was the pub open year round? And then somebody answered, oh, Tom, I don't know which Tom, Tudor, said it was only open for the summer weeks. Bob Reedy that Dave mentioned was the superintendent of the principal. I don't remember that. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a chat option if you're interested. Stan, do you want to call anybody out? Anybody you see? Hey, 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 Stan. Yeah. Talk about, tell us about your secret pizza sauce. Yeah. Oh, well, so in college, I worked at a couple of pizza places and they were really high volume. And it's like they had these bag of spices that you'd make five gallons of pizza sauce at a time. And everybody's secret spice recipe was the the their their taste, you know, for their pizza that made that they sold. And so when I came home, I'd been I'd been working at Pizza Inn, which was a really high volume. And I brought three or four of those bags of spices with me. And and we so we started making pizza and using those spices, and they were really good, but we could see that was gonna run out. So Rock Chicario over here in, in the Yellow House, which is Castellani, it well, was, was Castellani's house right on the corner of the Boatyard Road here. He was a chef. And so we brought a bag of spices to him and he tasted it and smelled it. He counted grains of things and this, that, and the other. And about a week later, he came back with a recipe on how we could make it. And I don't know how exact close it was, but that was our secret recipe for the whole time that, you know, that, that I was associated with making pizzas there. It had to be something. Yeah. Well, John Oldham, what are your memories? When did you start? Where is John? Right there. Oh, what is oh, that? that? The Diesel Brothers. Keep on trucking. Ah, I got some of those. Yeah, it, it, it's Dave Lewis's fault. Wait, wait, <laughs> so I had to go to Ithaca College and, uh, and then the Navy band and then a whole Connecticut uh, connection. And he said, well, we we're picking and grinning down in Jersey, I think. And uh, this was 73. And he said, come on up to, uh, to Islesboro. It's a really cool place. Got the pub and all that. And he showed me a picture, a black and white picture of these two women with motorcycles and rain gear on with a mass of hair and <laughs> so my fate was sealed <laughs> so yeah. that's how it happened i think so uh, i don't remember a lot from that <laughs> so willie how did you get the how did you get there did you get there through thorn where is willie is he there He's down another page he'll come with us there we go i'm here Ah. I had to get a sweater. Oh. I um yeah, I got there with Joe. I 
I grew up about two doors down from Joe in upstate New York. And he came, we got hanging out in the afternoons and he said, hey, well, you got to come up and check this out. So we came up Thon in the old green hornet he had. I remember. And, and Joe and I all came up and went to uh, visit Dave Lewis, who was, I believe, living in, was it Cliff Stone's house? Yep. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know that you could drive a, a car onto a boat. So, I mean, I came from <laughs> like the woods of the Androndacks. You know, I didn't have a clue. So I was 19. And so then uh, came back home, said, well, we're heading up and, and came back up in June, I think. And all summer, all that June, it rained and it was cold. We had a fire going every day upstairs. But came and lived and Joe made a deal. I guess Joe did. I don't know that Thon and Joe and I would be the house band and we could live upstairs. And I went to her to work for uh, Mr. Ellis, which I still have his hat. I wear it in videos now and again. <laughs> he gave me a hat one day. He sent me out with a chainsaw and a hat to cut down something in his backyard. I was, he was pretty trusting, but uh, we played all summer. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it, from then on, this was home for me pretty much. So, it was quite a summer. I was I was in the pub uh, when oh in Makube met Makube the first day, and that was interesting. And and I was there when he was persuaded. I was in the pub when he was persuaded to leave, and and that was pretty interesting too. Yeah. But um, you want to clarify what that means? <laughs> not overly. I don't know. I mean, some people talk to to him about some stuff that was going on okay and it, you know but um that's something i i liked about it was that you know i i was really lucky i got along with people and some like terry babbage there was one night people were in the in because you, you'd be in the pub and then you'd have to take a break to go get if you wanted to drink something stronger and beer you had to make a quick run over to the end and then come back you know Anyways, I don't know. There's probably stories that are good and stories that aren't good. But anyways, the music, there were so many. Remember, there was a one time there was a band who was, I guess you'd call it busking now, were busking at, in, in Camden. And the cops were going to put them in jail. And somebody, I don't remember who, maybe somebody here knows, saw them and said, no, well, it's okay. There was us and brought them to Islesboro and they played. They were good. I mean, it was just so many musicians. I remember one night, um, Glenn, Glenn Dubois used to have in the corner. He, it, I think, I can't remember what year it was, but he was, we were going to play and it was like a bunch of us playing country rock songs. And we went over to Andy's house and beforehand and we're and eating and, and Glenn was drinking sherry and he had on a gold lame suit and he came back over and we played country rock songs him in the corner with that gold lame suit and his his equipment went from the floor to the ceiling and it was it was way more he had more equipment for his bass than we any of us ever had for a pa and uh and he and he played about three notes for any one that I could play cleanly, you know. I mean, it was just, and you know, it was a night, just another night there. But you know, um, and we used to have these big. At one point, I'd play. I th maybe when Sears Mont was in there or something, we'd play, and we had these big speakers, clips. Um, I forget what they were, well, scholars or whatever they were called, and they were big, big. It took two of us to carry them in, you know. And we'd set them on tables. And I thought I used to set always over to the right. And they would be rocking forward and back. And there would get like to the beat of the song. People would start dancing and the floor would bend with the song. And these speakers would be like go. And I why they didn't fall on the floor, I don't know. I don't I never remember them falling. But boy, they'd be just a rocking. And outside you could always I remember um Sue Reedy and people of that age would all be standing out in the window. I remember they'd be outside, like staring in the window at us playing, you know. Um, 
but anyway, so that's a long answer to your question. But yeah, I came up with Joe and Thong. They basically shanghaied me, I guess, is what Joe would say, I think. Joe and Thon, you must remember, you know more about that than I ever did. I forget most things now, so, you know, it's just a... Too well, much of, the way I understand it and remember it, Stanny and... Am I on? Yep. Yes. Stanny and, D, and DP, we were there, Thon and I were there in the early, early days, the first days, and we would hang out Thon and I and play acoustic guitars and about four Bob Dylan songs and that's all we knew. And uh, <laughs> so Stanny says, hey, you guys are pretty good. What do you think about playing here? And Thon and I looked at each other like two deer in the headlights <laughs> and said, uh, Gee, uh, I don't know. And then we kind of looked at each other and said, Willie Kelly. So I went down in Shanghai and he was playing at a lounge in Utica, New York, Four Acres, I think was the name of it, with a rock and roll revival band. There was about 19 of them on stage and they all had their hair slicked back and, and camels and lucky strikes rolled up in their t-shirts. And there's a spotlight in the middle of the stage with my man, Willie Kelly, on his knees with his hands praying, singing, singing Teen Angel. I kid you not, with a spotlight. And he had his hair slicked back with dippity do. And, and he had luckies rolled up in his pocket. And I said, there's my man, there's no question. It was, it was made, it had to be. So I, I made him the offer about a lot of pizza, a lot of beer and you'll live right over the jukebox. And he said, where do I sign? And he was, uh, so we loaded up my Volkswagen the next day and we we're on our way back up to Islesboro. And that's, that's, uh, that's the, my historical account. That's kind of fuzzy probably, but. Um, so who had this jukebox? What, who was running the you had a, jukebox? Yeah, you 75. guys had the who was running it in 75? Because I remember Whiff, it's the last year Whiff was there. So Whiff lived upstairs and... Uh, Angela, Angela and uh, Angela Sarah ran it in 75. Right, Angela? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's what... Yeah, Angela and Sandy and Sarah and Sarah Nevins ran it in 75. Angela, it, did you get it? Oh, that sounds like and did they have the jukebox? Is that when that happened or? I think it was early on, the jukebox. Cause I remember sitting there with Shemanska listening to uh, the Eagle tune and we we're singing it at the top of our lungs. Uh, <laughs> I can't know, it was one of those early Eagle songs. <laughs> used to have, and it had some Linda Ronstadt on it. Yeah. And it, and it was right, my room was the corner. And, and right. it was right, right over on that wall. I literally slept right over the jukebox. So nothing went on without me knowing about it. You know, right? <laughs> nice. And that jukebox disappeared. And um, I was up visiting Joe Durkee a year later, maybe up in his trailer, up by Durkee's store. And he had that jukebox right in his living room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more, all, I have one more little in, story. You know? And then I'll, I'll hand it over. But Fon and I, and maybe Willie, we're uh, up in the room, maybe we're taking a break or it was late and we're, you know, smoking a left-handed cigarette probably and uh, drinking a few beers. And we hear this clanking on the upstairs window and we go, what the hell is that? And it's, you could see that it was a ladder, <laughs> summer, warm night. And- uh, Oh, uh -oh. where'd you uh -oh. go, Joe? Who was it? Who was it? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> and lo and behold, I see this head come up and it's Nipper Fairfield. <laughs> <laughs> and behind him in tow is Gussie Coombs and Lee Lover. Oh. And they had <laughs> jugs and beer and they wanted to come up and, and I guess partake in our smoking ritual, you know? 
And, uh, <laughs> and for some reason, they uh, didn't want to use the door. I don't know why. The ladder was there, I guess. <laughs> so up, up they came. We had ourselves a little party there. <laughs> so it was, that was a that was a memory that I I had to share uh, with this gathering because you you knew them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yep. <laughs> what about Angela? Angela? Do we get the share screen? Really? Can we hear from you? Um, I don't have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when I ran it that well, I worked there for many years <clears throat> when I was old enough to. Before that, Isabel and I used to um, sit in the field across the road and with Boone's Farm apple wine and, and, mm. and watch everybody going in and out and all of that. But you know, I, when I when I was old enough, I finally was old enough. I did work there a lot. And what I'll tell you, what I remember is I remember working mighty hard. That's what I remember is being tired. Is I remember I remember that once it began, it was nonstop. Mm -hmm. it, it was nonstop. It was, and you had to collect all those mugs because the demand was great, and there weren't that many of them. And <laughs> that's what I remember is is gathering mugs and washing them and trying to get them just keeping the flow going <laughs> but that's what i that's what i remember i worked really i remember working hard that's what i remember so can everybody hear me yeah no. let me just show a few pictures I, I don't have many but here we so can you see my screen yeah no. so here's dp and angela right there i think that could have been the 1975 here is the new dance plane. There's George Post and Glenn, Glenn and yeah. Phil. I got a better picture of Phil later. That, that something? Yeah, it's great. I got, I, here's my mother and DP's I, mother having root beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another one, there's John Peck and DP, but now wow. we're gonna get into some. Oh. Here we go. So here's the new dance again. Here's Phil Clayton rocking it out and Glenn and oh, yeah. George is always rocking. Is that Mike Who's Durkee? the drummer in that band? Someone said Mike Durkee. It looked like him, but I don't know. I don't know who the drummer was. Uh, I think this is Dave Lewis's guitar. Yeah. And that, and I took that, that picture. I took that picture and we developed it in the little dark room in the shed right between the pub and Freddie Pellman's house. Yep, wow. and that's what the bar looked like. Look at those bar stools. The Bowery, man. Wow. That cat's name on the other guitar, on Rocky's guitar, is Freckles. Oh, look at that guy. <laughs> that's upstairs in the pub, going in the back door. I don't know whose head that is in front of him. Who is it? I don't know. Oh, who is that? Oh, this is Phil Davinsky, I think. Oh yeah, that was yeah. That's Phil. Sure. That's yeah. Phil. In those days, I don't know where Carol was, and here's a small picture of dollar fifty. Music four to four to seven. A uh, happy hour? I don't know. No. Yeah, that was happy hour. So we think we think Caitlin thinks this is Aaron. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> They've been casing each other out. I'm not sure. And I think I think this is Anne Marie. Anne Marie. Mm -hmm. And let's just see. These are all Anne's pictures. And so that's Frank. And I think that's John, isn't it? John and Dave? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diesel Brothers. Where Frank, I? that's you. That's yeah. you. Where's Frank? Right there dancing. Right there? He was oh a dancer. God. How come he did right there. out there, Frank? Where's your trumpet? I don't know. <laughs> you were dancing. I was dancing. You know. That has oh. Isabel and Andy. <laughs> we think this is Janet. Confirm, Janet. Hey, Janet, yes. is this you? Yeah. <clears throat> Janet. Janet Ottman. 
Hello, hello in there. Hello. Which one? Can you unmute? Just yeah. press your space bar. You press the space bar. Uh, Going to work, maybe. Yeah, you muted. I think that's Janet. I think it probably is, or Judy. I can't tell the <laughs> I think it might be Judy, actually. I think that might have been my sweater. I think it might be too. I think it's Judy. I think so too. Now you know how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Everard? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is that Judy Durkee dancing out front? I see mm. Kathy oh, Hale. Leech. <clears throat> That's Kathy Hale on That's the yes. left. Yeah. Over there. But... <clears throat> oh. Mm. oh, there's a voice. There's a picture. Uh, the regulars. <laughs> and on Sunday afternoons after the softball game, people used to come back and open it up for it wasn't open, so we'd have a there was a uh, a jar, just throw money in a jar. Mm -hmm. Who's this? That's Angela. That's Andy. No, that's Andy. Andy, Andy I mean, I'm sorry, you're right. That's Andy collecting money. I, re I remember one time uh, when Frank was living upstairs and he had his dog, Wilma. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Wilma had a need and it came leaking right down through the floorboards. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but it, it on top of the piano there had an old Fender Rhodes and had the notebook <laughs> open. And I still have it. There's a yellow page. And this <laughs> song was Old Dogs, Children, and Watermelon Wine. She was very musical. <laughs> oh, yeah. We brought out the best in her. <laughs> oh. Oh, look at that. Wow. Yeah, I can do that. <clears throat> That's Eric and Glenn and me. And um, Randy yeah. What's his name? Oh Randy, Randy Purrington, was it Randy? Randy, thank you. Randy Purrington? Was it was Randy that? Johnson? It says. Randy That's Spencer. Randy. Randy Johnson drew it. Randy Remy Johnson came up and would draw pictures of us playing or whatever was going on. A lot of them were on brown paper bags and stuff or brown paper. He just sit drawing all the time. In the emails, somebody asked the question about who played in the Outer Space Band. And uh, I remember hearing them. And I saw I hang out with some guys out in Searsmont that know all of them. And it was Compton Maddox, Johnny Moses, Mike Whiskey, and Al Klondike were four of the members of the Outer Space Band. And they still play. They're still around. And there's Elliot. Elliot on the keyboard. And Uncle Al on the trombone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know he played with them. Oh, I, I have a story. You know what? I played for years with, um, for a few years with Judd Strunk, who was a main humorist that, you know, he traveled around, he'd have a song. Well, I was coming on, I was in line, and I was riding over with Rob Demetria. And we were going to the pub. I had a gig that night. And he was giving me a ride over. I think I had sold one morning. I got up and I had a van and Shake wanted to buy it. And we went over to the inn, I believe, and we're drinking mimosas on a Sunday morning and whatever morning it was. And so he just, he wanted to buy it. I said, no, after, I don't know how many pictures of mimosas, we decided I'd, I'd sell him my van. I had been living up in Sugarloaf. And he would take me to the music store in Camden and I would buy a Martin guitar I'd seen and then he would give me a ride home, which he did. And then on the way back, the thing broke. But I owed him two, I, two gigs and I played his wedding and I played his, his second wedding party 
like 20 years later or whatever, 25 years later. And the band all got a kick off because he paid the band, but he didn't have to pay me. But meanwhile, so I'm riding over with Rob Demetrius and he says, oh, come meet this guy. And it turned out in line to get on the island was Judge Strunk. And so Rob knew him somehow. And, and so we got talking. We spent all afternoon sitting and drinking beer at the bar there and, and had quite a time. And that night he sat in with, I guess it must have been Blue Northern. And um, later on that winter, I wrote him a letter once, said no, nothing's in the next spring. He hired me and, and I toured with him for a couple of years. So that was just from getting in line at the pub, getting in line at the ferry to go to the pub. Hey, Judy, tell, tell us the story when you and Alan first started running the pub, when you came up, <laughs> you had some funny stories. Oh, uh, wow, well, let's see. D DP, I had just started dating Alan and Janet Wood DP came to our house in Hope and said, anybody want to run the pub? Should we run the pub this summer? And Alan's thinking, you know, he was, he was like, oh yeah, he got all jacked up about it because he had been a bar owner, runner in Connecticut. He said, yeah, I'll do it. Great. That'll be really fun. So we sign on to run the pub. This is 1982. So it's opening night and it's the Searsmont Street Band. Of course, it's our band. And um, it was really wild. It was crazy. It was unbelievable. Everybody, you know, was dancing as they always do. And all of a sudden people, the dancers start flashing the band. And the band, <laughs> you remember those days? And the band starts flashing the dancers and everyone <laughs> in the stare. You know, it was just one of those nights. It wasn't that big a deal to me because I just remember the pub being kind of wild. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to bed that night and now looks at me and says, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is way too much for me. I, I didn't expect this. And I said, oh, Alan, it was just the opening night. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't remember seeing anybody's rear end. It never got better. It never got better. Uh, one, one quick story about music. Well, we had it one year. We tried to get diverse, you know, the different kind of music. So there was a guy in Camden named Glenn Jenks, who was a piano player. And a really honky -tonk piano player that was really well known. Oh, a wonderful player. Um, honky tonk, you know, just a jazzy piano. So we needed a piano for him to, to use. And the only piano we knew on the island was from Dave Shemanska. So we borrowed Dave's piano and we drove it to the pub and Glenn played, everyone had a great time. On the way home, bringing the piano back to Dave, we stopped at the ball field because there was a softball game going on and the piano rolls out of my truck oh. and rolls down the hill. <laughs> and then I go ahead and bring back Dave's piano to him in different pieces. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was one of those nights that I was like, no, this isn't really happening. But, they were generous enough to let us fix his piano, but it was like one of those things that, you know, you learn your lesson, stick with rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I can keep going about music. Go ahead. <laughs> we all had the nude ants play a lot. And that's when they were first really, you know, clicking. And it was just, the place always was fun. But, you know, we would sometimes have like Everide play and this guy, he brought his friend Tim Farrell, who was pretty well known, um, a fiddle player in Maine. And we had a guy play at the saw. And it was always, we had music Thursday, Fridays and Saturdays. And we'd sit outside and collect a cover. And maybe, I don't remember, maybe it was a dollar, two dollars. And that would pay for the band. And it was always like, people were so appreciative. At the same time, when we were running it, we paid no rent. And Frank owned the building. And he was nice enough to let us, the only way for us to survive in order to, you know, to make any money at all was not having to pay rent. And I think Frank said, if you just paid the insurance on the building, that would be enough. And that's, that's how we said, you know, so Frank, thanks, Frank. You, you helped us pull it together. Yeah. But it was um, one of those things that it was always fun. It was, it was always fun. So, okay, I'll move on. <laughs> so, so who remembers Doug Van Nostrand? Remember the wh he whistle? Oh, oh yeah, whistle. Yeah, he's down in St. John, Virgin Islands. He's been yeah. down here for 
probably 30 years. He's still whistling? He is. We, uh, we actually went down there about five years ago and he's still uh, doing his famous takeovers. So he, he may have nothing to do with the band that was playing, but he'll just go right on stage and tell somebody to turn up the mic and start whistling. <laughs> So he had some real songs. He had some good songs. Oh, good yeah. words to his song. Great, yeah, great songs. Songs. Uh, but I, I wanted to tell a story about um, Judy was mentioning uh, pulling pants down. I think we called it dropping trowel back then. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was I was playing at Raul's, which was a wonderful club down in Portland, probably about 20 years later. It must have been in the 90s. And and I wish I knew who it was that came over to me and, and during a, a, a break and very genuinely said, you know, I'm really enjoying your music, but please don't pull your pants down again. <laughs> <laughs> I look at Islesboro and she goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I missed yeah. the pants pulling down. Yeah, oh, you that it, that's a good thing, Angela. So in those first years of the pubs, there was a window, it still is, second floor, right in the middle of the building. That was the place to move, right there. <laughs> People would come in and they're walking in. The and... <laughs> I missed it. It went farther than that. Nobody's mentioned the six yet. Who's talking? Who? Yeah. If you if you can mute yourself, Dave Shemanska here. That'll that'll um take out the noise. But I think Dave was talking. I I was trying to talk, but if it's not my turn, I won't. <laughs> Dave, I think your mic is a little hot. If you can turn your mic down a little somehow, that would help. I think. The better. Maybe Hello. So. Don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, mentioning um, bare rear ends, nobody's mentioned those streakers. Hey, Tom, I, see some people, I see some people smiling. <laughs> no one remembers that but me. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Oh, well, I remember. I remember a bachelor party that was held in the pub. Where the that'll be, that'll be Nobody certain. knows about that either, Dave. <laughs> okay, be, I wasn't there. I don't remember. <laughs> and Stanley remembers it. Right? Uh, yeah, we, we stopped. We stopped being a freaking. Somebody's interfering here. No. Can everybody put their, their microphone on mute so that we don't have a lot of background there noise? There we go. That's yeah, better. Is that better? I think Phil yeah. Clayton just joined from Europe. What's going on, Phil? Where are you? Phil. I saw him a minute ago, but. Diana Post, do you have George stories? I wish, you know, it was, it was the, that obstacle race in the parking lot and all the weed that was going around has destroyed my memory for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Does everybody remember that big uh, mud puddle that was in the parking lot? For a long time? <laughs> yes. It was the parking lot. Yeah, somebody yep. uh, one night had a canoe on the roof of their car, and somebody launched the canoe into the puddle. That that was that was me. That was me and Gilbert Leach. We launched a punt into the puddle. I've that? got that album, Phil Davinsky. We've got that album. Yeah, new dance. I remember one night when uh, the place was full and it was crowded a Saturday night. And somebody went out front for a minute and noticed that the sky was wall to wall aurora borealis, and yeah. everyone trooped out into the parking lot and stood there and uh -huh. just gasped. So yeah, upstairs in the pub, we had taken out. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we had taken out a picture window from the front and moved it upstairs and built a dormer under it. If probably a lot of people remember that, and we had a big old easy chair in there. 
and what what a viewing spot and it was a a summer of the aurora borealis going up one side and right over your head out the other side of the sky it was just yeah. amazing and i think it was real it was real <laughs> You know, I can remember a couple, well, I've got a lot of good memories there too, but when the first time I went to the pub was probably 72, I'm guessing, somewhere around there, one, two, and the uh, first night I walked in, there's a huge poker game going on, and I didn't really know many people at all, and I remember this old guy sitting at the head of the table, he was probably in his 80s, and, and then this big guy, who I found later was Gilbert, with a big brown paper bag beside him, rolling these great big doobies and passing it around the poker table. And I can remember who I found out later was Freddie Pendleton puffing away and just looking up for a minute and saying, man, have I got a buzz. <laughs> and it just was so surreal that I just, it just seemed unreal to me. And then it was just great. And then later on, of course, uh, some of you may remember Carol, who came out lived with me for a while, worked there one summer. Carol, and, uh, that's yeah. the missing. We, we have a picture. Her, we've seen her picture and didn't know who she was. Carol, oh. yeah, Carol Downing, and um, and then uh, so I'd come down and pick her up late and spend a lot of time there. And I can remember that night with the uh, Northern Lights, and that was that's etched into my memory. That was amazing. They were red and green and looked like ribbon candy in the sky and uh it was crazy so does anybody have any so part of the pub also was the aries party and i don't know if there were two or three of them but i i can remember one story where it was it, what is this in, in the middle of march and we had opened the pub and, and it was just full of people from away and that we'd had a door prize of somebody had rolled a joint out of a newspaper. It was like a half a pound of pot joint. And, and so the local constable came in just as it was going by the door. And he turned right around and left and came back about 20 minutes later without his uniform on. <laughs> He'll be, he shall be, he's still alive, that guy. Oh, yeah. I guess we shouldn't mention him. But. Who was the guy who came in and said everybody's doing quaaludes? Everyone oh, was doing quaaludes. Well, I guess okay. So, so DP and I, I these are hard stories to admit. You know, but <laughs> way back in the beginning, we decided that one of us had to be straight every night. I mean, it, it didn't include smoking pot, but you know, you like you couldn't be tripping. And so I was the straight guy, and everybody in the pub. I shouldn't be telling these stories, but there's no statute of limitations, right? Everybody in the pub is doing quaaludes, and I guess we're in uncharted territory. It's here, okay. We? You're going for it. I, <laughs> I broke so, that ice. And Jack Leach comes in, and he sits at the bar, and he orders a beer. And it's like him and me, and everybody's doing quaaludes. And Jack's looking around to the left and the right, and he says, finally, he says, you know, something's not right here. He says, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it was funny at the time. I couldn't let I couldn't let it happen. I couldn't tell him. I think it was at one of the the last couple of years, but it was an Aries party, and I'm not going to mention any names, but somebody had a big bag of mushrooms, and I I think probably there are maybe a hundred people in the pub, and out of a hundred, I'm going to guess about ninety of them <laughs> delved into the bag of mushrooms. I just remember just having the most fun I think I've ever had that the night. Best music ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Phil, you always knew the words. And if I didn't, I made them up. <laughs> <laughs> you did not. And they rhymed. How would you know? <laughs> well, they rhymed. Uh, what's an Aries party? Uh, People there were so you. many. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Yep. So there was just so many people that had uh, birthdays in March and April, and the sign zodiac sign of Aries. So we decided to have a have a party there. I remember Mary Christie was a she had a birthday in their time. She she would attend those parties too. But it was just a reason to get out, 
get through the winter. It was. It was. It was just a... that that big joint. I remember helping roll it. Tom was living across the street, I think, at, at uh, K. Mitchell's house at the time. Yeah. I, think rolled, I think we rolled it over there and brought it over. Is that, is that right, Tom? <laughs> yeah. We, we had, we had a, a free yeah. party party and rolled that over there, and then we made it over to the club later in the evening. Yeah, that was some night. Nice. I wanted to ask if anybody remembers Benny Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. On the with a oranges in a bra and yeah. his pantyhose pulled up over nothing. I mean, plenty, mind you. What, what, wasn't that for Sandy Nevin wedding party, bachelor party? Yeah. Maybe. I, I think it was. So. I think there are pictures of that somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Laughed very hard, almost as hard as I did when Phil dropped trout. <laughs> the, is that anyway. what called with his his um his bra with oranges and his pantyhose jumped up on a table yeah. and was dancing, gyrating in front of everybody's faces. <laughs> he had nylon straps <laughs> on too. Yeah. Yeah. No pantyhose. Yeah, he had pantyhose. Pantyhose. It was a pantyhose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those were the times, you know. Benny was out of control in those days. Yeah, that was. <laughs> and I was just. And then when I when I mentioned that about Phil knowing the words, it was always he knew the words to Dixie Chicken because that was Benny's song, of Benny's theme song. <laughs> Isn't the pub where the Turtleheads Boys Choir? I ask you a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he knew the words there too. There was there would there be go. no boys choir without you, Phil. You what knew the you words. You got Angela. <laughs> show that again. Angela, show that again. Oh, I I think that I don't think it's the complete choir, but it was. This is what would happen wherever they would land, wherever they would sit, they would just start singing. And every now and then, I think they got invited up onto the stage. Yeah. <laughs> I always tried to get on a Phil's, I mean, on to, yeah, on a Phil's microphone. I don't... <laughs> Here's a close up of Sandy Nevins, who was part of that. Wow. Nah. And there he is with Willette. They look pretending oh, yeah. like twins in that picture. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Wow. And actually, I have one more of Joe and Willie and David Lewis. <laughs> Close. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they looked in good shape in that picture. Yeah. 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 And so, Joe, you were playing lead guitar in those days, weren't you? You weren't playing bass. <laughs> when you started out, weren't you, a, weren't you the lead guitar player, like in Pelican? Nah, I, was, I was pretty much always on the bass, I think. Okay. When, with Son Willie, I might have played some acoustic, you know, but yeah, mostly. Okay. I just remember you being mm -hmm. the first really good guitar player I knew. And I, oh, <laughs> well, you didn't know could, many. <laughs> Joe could keep playing. Joe could, at the way the stage was when in 75 at least, there was like a little, like what, six inch high stage or four inch high. Yeah. Stage, right. But it didn't go all the way to the door to the kitchen. There was a door over on that side, right? Right. And, and so the deal was, one night, I, every once in a while, you'd look over, and if we three of us would be up there, and if <laughs> it would get a little tight, and so every once in a while, Joe would take a step too far to the left, and off he'd go, <laughs> headed into the, and he could do that without dropping a note. <laughs> he'd go off into the kitchen, and uh, we'd be a duo until he'd get back, you know. <laughs> so I thought of one more. Oh, go ahead, David. I was going to say to Phil, uh, another band that played there, I think, a few times was the All Hollow Hut Stuff Band, right? Yeah. 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 Who was that? Uh, probably 1981 or two. Was the it, last couple of years is when that Bruce band was Baldwin? around. Wow. Uh, who was in it? It was uh, Ben Smith and Sam Smith and Bruce Bogey and I. Yeah. Oh, Bruce Bogey. Uh, Good band. Very good band. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I have a question. Does anybody remember the night some, uh, I guess they were in a van, I don't know. They showed up, they had driven across the country from Oregon. Does anybody remember them? They played old backwoods bluegrass music all night and they, they would, does anybody else remember this? Am I, was I the only one there? Yes. No, I remember that. Do you do? Oh, I, thank well, God. That was when you were running it, right? I don't know. I <laughs> yeah, they were, they were really good, too. That was the deal. I mean, they, they were, were really good. Yeah. I'm glad you remember. I'm glad somebody remembers. Well, there were a lot of people that were really good. I remember Paul Siebel came and remember Dobro Dick was there and, yeah. and Jack McGann. Is that his name? Yeah. And hey, he sang Louise. That's it. What about um, the tuba player? Uh, yeah. Dane? Dane, yeah. Dane. Did he Dane run the pub? Eric, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yes, he, Eric. Is Eric? He was, he was an Ithaca boy. Dean Marion. Yeah, he was the third he, Diesel brother. Yeah, he played uh, tuba oh, at his wedding, first dance. He he also said, I remember him saying one one Sunday morning after we were all hungry, he says, "This is the only place I know where you could see people dance to a tuba solo." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was a good tuba solo. That was a good tuba solo. <laughs> And Eddie Kovetsky. Oh, he yeah. Yeah. That's Eddie. Yeah. Did he, was he the one that, when the, who first did the song about when the creek, uh, with the creek don't rise or what was that? That was George yeah. Cooper. That was who? George Cooper, but he was never oh, at the pub. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, wait, oh. he might have been. He was on the island, but I don't think he ever yeah. played. No. He, oh, Rick Jostag. Uh, yeah. Oh, Rick, the trumpet. <laughs> yeah. So somebody said that uh, Leonard Cohen was at, at the pub. Is that true? Was no, Leonard right. Cohen? Somebody said that. I don't know if it's we can validate. I don't. I know he did. I don't think he performed there. Yeah. Would have been nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Nobody's. Hey, you know, um, <clears throat> we. I don't. I don't remember who was playing that night, but we played. I think Phil or Willie and myself and Jeff Densmore, and probably. And we, we played moon dance and uh, and as guy jumps up with a flute and starts playing that part right off the freaking record, you know, <laughs> and I'm, we're all looking at him like he note for note. I mean, he had it down and, and I thought, man, this guy has really rehearsed this part. <laughs> so we get done and, and we're taking a break. We're out, out front there. And I, I walked up to him and I said, boy, that was a beautiful part and a really good solo and it goes well it ought to be i wrote it whoa really? well i don't know if anybody else can verify that but <laughs> apparently he was uh he played that part on van morrison's uh it's your old friend frank so i think you're maybe really I hot smoked too much pot that night maybe i don't know but... it's hey. sorry yeah <clears throat> i believe it sorry. hey stan yeah I think you were running the pub, but remember when uh, Nixon was on Minot Island and those people, you know, used to see guys come in with black pointy shoes and yeah. <laughs> they were Secret Service or something checking us out. They were. They had uh, dark glasses and yep. you know, they were like right out of, uh, what is it? Uh, anyway, you know, dark glasses and, and top hats and like men in black. Men in black, yeah. Well, it was probably yes. Yeah, who who could those guys be? Well, I think yeah, they they went down. They went down Robert's driveway. I know that. I remember that. Yeah, oh. they, they knew where they were going. Yeah. Speaking of Robert, Mary Walsh, where are you? I think she texted in that she had to go to something else. Oh, oh something yeah. yeah. But she said something about this was a lot of great laughs. And, oh, good. Oh. Hey, so there was a, there's a question about an upside down Ferrari. <laughs> Don't know that. I know nothing. <laughs> Wasn't my car. <laughs> who, who posed that question? I'm not sure. Yeah. It was, it was a, an unfounded rumor, apparently. I think so. Hey, does anybody remember the debutante party? 
We all left the pub and crashed it. <laughs> that was at Larkin's. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You might remember it was a great, they had a great band from New York. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. 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 Band, yeah. That was yeah. fun. I remember. We should have streaked it. Yeah, we should have. <laughs> I remember that Will Dick and a friend of his from Boston played. We walked, we yeah. walked into. What? Who? We walked into the, we walked into KK's, that party we walked down from the pub. There was probably 15 people. We're all dressed in flannel, sh flannel shirts and jeans. And we walk into this place. Everybody's in tuxes and gowns. And um, everybody was kind of afraid to go in. And I, I was like, hey, what? Pretend like you're supposed to be here. No, and if they kick us out, they kick us out. So we all walk in, belly up to the bar, grab a drink, and KK walks over to me and she goes, "Dave, you got a cigarette?" I said, "I guess we're good. We're good to go." So uh, we spent the whole night in there. It was wonderful. It was fun. But the other thing I was thinking of that nobody's mentioned so far is the uh, late night swimming parties. Yeah, really. Somebody would um, about maybe one o'clock say, hey, let's go down to so-and-so's place and go swimming. So all of a sudden there'd be 35 naked people in a pool at two o'clock in the morning. And there were a couple, three pools around town. So we availed ourselves of a number of them a number of different times. It was uh, it was something I'll never forget. But you look around, there's 35 naked people all screeching and hooting and hollering. I think there are a bunch of worried about where the clothes are, and there. I remember when I'm down at Dillon, somebody. You're breaking up, Dave. Go ahead. Hey, Phil Clayton. Hey. Hey. What time is it in Europe? Uh, let's see. It's uh, uh about. 10 15 here. Oh. Anyway, one one night somebody let her wall down here. Kind of caught by the box the whole thing. But we can, we can. Who's talking? I'm breaking up. Yeah. Hey, Phil, I just heard the story. Maybe it came from you about you watching your left hand play and not yeah. knowing you were there. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, is that true? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, it was you that it was you that made that statement actually, <laughs> because uh, um, I had spent the day. Uh, uh, well, you know, Jimmy Jimmy Hendrix wrote this song about something called Purple Haze, and uh, <laughs> it was oh. magnificent stuff. And uh, I'd done some Purple Haze that whole day, and I wound up the day at the pub, and I was playing there with my girlfriend Carrie, and uh, I was still. Excuse me while I kiss this guy. <laughs> I was looking at my hand like, wow. Look at <laughs> but the thing I remember, one of the things I remember was that um, I, I, uh, we would all get different musicians together in different combinations. And then we would try to kind of figure out what we were going to do because it had to be something we could all play together, you know. And so you'd find yourself on stage with someone that you, you know, you of course didn't rehearse or anything like that, you know, you'd have to jam on stage, you know. So I thought, well, you know, pick something easy, you know. So I started playing uh, Rainy Day Women by um, uh, Bob Dylan, you know. Uh, does anybody, anybody remember that? Sure. They're the stone not... you when you're trying to be so good. The stone yeah. you... And so there was this guy named Ulrich. Ulrich he played trumpet. Uh, does anybody remember him, Ulrich? A guy named Ulrich who played trumpet. Yeah, and, yeah. Shot stag. yeah and, and all I said, look, all you have to do is play these notes. Da 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 <laughs> da, 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 da da You know, that's how, how it goes, right? So I'm up there going, they're stone you when you're trying to be so good. The stone you just like, etc. And this guy with the trumpet, Ulrich, behind me is going like this. <laughs> And, oh, yeah. and so I, I said, like, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I have to have a word with uh, one of the musicians here. Excuse me for a moment. And turn around and said, what the fuck are you doing? 
<laughs> I said, pay four notes, four notes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Ulrich who made the sign at a party at Dave's house, at his cabin. Um, he carved a sign for Blue Northern, which it still hangs in downstairs in my kitchen. It's a big plank. And while we were all just hanging out, eating and barbecuing and whatever, he carved out this sign with a little acorn and some oak leaves. All of the suffragists. They were incredibly weak and beaten up and tortured. Yes, they hadn't eaten in days, and nobody wanted to have a dead suffragist on their hands. Well, oh. Alice Paul and the others on hunger strike were the first to. Somebody be needs to mute. It so. If we could all mute, if you're not talking. Oh, here comes Ando. Here comes Ando. If we have any questions for him. Ando, are you here? And I want to hear from Frank what it was like owning the pub all these years with other people running it. Frank? <laughs> There you go. I was just looking through it, looking at a reference oh. to my old friend John Payne. What was he? A moon dance. He played on moon dance, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Is this Frank? John Payne on the. Yeah. Instrument. Frank, who owned it very, a lot of years. Yeah. I was passive in <laughs> my ownership, but I had fun. <laughs> I did, loved it a lot. You know, I See Dave Shemanska. It's wonderful to see Dave Shemanska. I, I, I feel I feel connected. That's what I feel. Yeah. There you go. Right back at you, Frank. Good to see you. Yeah. Here we are. Here we are. <clears throat> Ando, are you there anywhere? Hello, Ando. I just joined, but I don't see. You. <clears throat> yeah, I got one more one more quick bar story. So. The beer, we tried to keep the beer cold, which is like almost impossible because it, you know, the way the, the refrigeration was. And one day a fellow came in with his manservant and he asked for a cold beer. And we gave him the beer and he drank and said, no, it's not cold enough. So Judy went ahead and gave him another beer. He took a sip and said, no, no, this isn't cold enough. <laughs> so Judy took the beer and she drank it. He said, no, this is fine and gave it back to him. <laughs> Needless to say, the manservant, like he didn't know what to say. And they paid for the beers and left. But it was like one of those situations that they, it, they didn't fit in well at the pub. If they were expecting cold beer and, and clean glasses, you know. Yeah, no, it's okay, it's okay. It's well, okay. the days when people were proud to have manservants here really were like chauffeurs and valets yeah. and women in French maid uniforms pushing prams down the road. Mm. Yeah. All right. I got a beer story. Oh, he's so beer story. Can anybody hear me? Okay? You're breaking. Yeah. If you turn off your video, we might be able to hear you better. How do you do that? Like, you go down to the bottom, you say stop video. Go, Edmund, while we wait. And I, I know that I was not on Islesboro until 1984, and I know I went to the pub. So I know the pub was open in 1984. And I think uh -oh. it might have been open in 1985, but maybe not. Who was running it? Dave Pendleton in 84. Huh. Certainly. Oh, well, he's not here to validate Well, that. he would have run it. Alan, were you there in 84? Well, we ran it in 82 and 83. And in 84, Dave Pendleton and I were working a job in New York State. Yeah. So he may have come back and ran it a little bit with, uh, with Andy. But I don't think he did a full job. <laughs> because we were working too much. Well, I remember seeing him behind the bar. No, maybe there was an 84. I'll change my time. But I think in 85, Everard opened up his bar. 
And maybe that was 85 and 86. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I heard it was 84, but yeah. I don't know. I don't know about, about Zums when that actually happened. But that was 85. Gary, Gary told me he's got posters from that, and he was going to look and check on that date, but he never has gotten back to me, so I don't know. It might have been 85 that Everard did it, but I know it's because I worked there. Maybe it was 85. I also worked at the Blue Heron in 85. So maybe the pub was closed in 85. But 84, it certainly was open. I, I too remember the floor and coming to it late because I attended bar at the Islesboro Inn. So I'd show up at 10 and everybody was already well lit. Um, <laughs> walking in to see all the tables on the edge of the place tipping in. I'm wondering why the glasses of beer didn't all fall over, but they didn't. <laughs> That's like Willie's story about the speakers. Um, yeah. yeah, it was a, people came over from, it was a, I mean, people in Camden knew it was a happening place, you know, they'd jump in their Makos and come on over in the dark and have a blast and then go back drunk. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, I think, oops, oh. sorry. I have one thing. I was just going to corroborate the '84 because I was pregnant with Dan the last summer and couldn't really have much fun. <laughs> so I think it was '84 was the last summer. Are oh, you thinking it was open in '74? '84. '84. '84. Yeah. Melissa, you have to go. No. Um. I mean, eventually, yeah, but um. <laughs> Anybody else? Final, final call, Edie, I see you. Hi, Edie. Did you want to? You're muted. You're muted. Do you want to unmute? There you go. How's that? That's yeah. good. OK. So what brought me to Islesboro was that, um, remember George Martin, the town manager, and he invited me up for an interview. So first they'd take me to the Owlsboro Inn and treat me to dinner and put me at a little, I think it was Sharon um, Hall who, took, who, who was our waitress. I'm not sure about that, but we had a little candle and everybody thought I was George's girlfriend. <laughs> 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 then they, they brought me and introduced me to Dave Coons at his house at the, at the um, health center there, right next to the, the pub. And... Um, he said, okay, you've seen, you've seen the end. Now let's go to the real place. So we go to the pub and that's, and of course they didn't show me the, the school or up Island or anything. It was really important for me to see the pub. I get into the pub and sitting at a table are Sonia Shemanska. And I think, I think, um, I don't know. There are a couple of other women there. And I walk in and David Kuhn says in a loud voice, uh, this is our new PA. Well, I wasn't yet the new PA because I hadn't really been offered the job. I was just visiting to see if I might want it if we were going to work out well. And um, oh no, this is the new PA. And Sonia jumps up and gives me this huge kiss on the lips, Sonia. <laughs> and goes, oh, I'm so glad you're gonna be the new kid. We need somebody like you. And that sealed the deal and I, I stayed. <laughs> Story of how I got to Islesboro, all because of the pub. And we ended up with some of the pub furniture too. You know, those great um, tables and benches. Yeah. We had for a long time. They're great. We may still have one of them. Where are they now? Well, that's a really good question. The I with me. Um, Anna Dean or Ben could maybe speak to that, but I think Anna Dean's gone off this conference, this call right now. But uh, we had them forever and ever. And even some of the glassware when it got sold out, which must have been in about 85, I would guess. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Thank you. You're welcome. Michael, did you have something to say real quick? Uh I'll wait for Bennett to talk. I think he's about to say something. I just wanted to say that, yeah, Anadine ended up with that bench and um, we had those glasses kicking around for years and years and years. And I always knew that those were the pub glasses and it was the pub bench. And I wanted to thank uh, everyone uh, who was involved in making music 
and fostering music at the pub um, and sort of even just showing up for the musicians and bussing tables and cooking pizza and all that because what it meant was I was raised in a community that celebrated music and musicians. Mm. And um, I think it made a really, I, it had a really profound uh, effect on my life, certainly because, uh, you know, I, I, Willie Kelly came, was my, taught me how to play the harmonica. And that mm. led me into a bluegrass band and one thing led to another. Dave Lewis showed me how to play the guitar. Uh, Ando has given me countless gigs and been a, been a feature in my family. John Oldham has basically taught every musician my age, whether it's on Islesboro or Lincolnville, uh, everybody says, oh yeah, John Oldham, sure, yeah, I took music with John Oldham. And uh, it's, it's um, led to some immense, I would say the most immensely satisfying part of my life has been being able to play music and share it with people. And it's even, you know, brought me all around the world and, and I was just asked to play for the Library of Congress this summer for the American Folk Life Center. And I think this sort of, uh, it would never have happened if it hadn't been for a pub and people just dancing their asses off and having a good time. You know, I just think that it's so, so important to recognize the spirit and energy of this generation of people who said, yeah, let's, let's not get stuck in our little boxes Let's figure out how to enjoy this life. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks to you guys and, and how meaningful it is. Well yeah, very well said. Okay, real quick, uh, Michael. Yeah, that was awesome, Bennett. Thanks for, thanks for putting it so clearly. Um, you know, this is Michael Hutcherson in case people are seeing me as Islesboro Media here. Um, I just wanted to put out a sort of a, a general call, uh, unofficial because I'm no longer officially a board member of the Historical Society, but nonetheless, I wanna make sure everybody here understands the importance not only of the oral history piece here, but the ephemera, the photographs, um, you know, this stuff needs to go someplace. Um, and I can't think of a better place for it to go than the Historical Society here on Islesboro. I know Patrick's mm -hmm. on a call here as well. Um, and, uh, you know, without the preservation of this sort of cultural phenomenon, um, it makes it that much harder for similar, um, similar things to happen in the future. Um, this, this, this tradition of passing down things like not only knowledge, but, but skill um, and taste um, and passion are is is it's really essential to the survival of especially a small community such as this. So, um, what what you have has tremendous value, um, and uh, make sure it goes to the right place. That's it. Thanks. Hey, Aries Party <clears throat> Historical Society this year. What was that? Aries Party Historical <laughs> Historical Society this year. Bring your own mushrooms. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So there'll be, there'll be a door prize. Great <laughs> segue. Not not the mushrooms or the door prize, but um, the um, the recording of of this information. Um, this entire um, conversation has been recorded, and um, it will be available on our the library website under um, archived webinars or something like that on our web page, which is alplibrary.org, where you found the link to this, um, this uh, chat. I want to thank everybody for coming and participating. Stanley, Diana, thank you so much for mm -hmm. making this happen. And um, next, our next Islesboro Interest Talk is going to be on um, the, uh, I think it's the 9th of March, and we're going to do um, we were going to do a trivia contest for the Maine Bicentennial last year, like a year ago, um, exactly. But we postponed everything. So um, that link will be, and we'll also include some Osbro trivia too. So if you'd like to participate, click on um, our website link. Thank you all so much for participating. It was really great to see people. So nice to, to see faces and, 
and feel free to reach out to each other um, now that you've reconnected, stay connected, and, and we'll see you uh, um, on the island. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.